right. Most Reverend Archbishop Gregory Venables, a.k.a. Mr. Venables, how are you, sir? I am very well, Christian. Thank you so much for being here. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Um, I've had uh, talks with leaders in the fields of artificial intelligence, cognitive science, uh, nutrition, uh, all kinds of zeitgeist topics. Um, but I hadn't really addressed a key theme in my upbringing and a key theme of my identity that was my Christian background. And I couldn't imagine a more fitting person to talk to uh, uh, at length about this, uh, given where the journey has taken me. And I think the time and place that we're in as a species today. Uh, so why don't we begin with a bit of your background and your story to see what your story with uh, Christianity is and how we can take it from there. A little bit about myself, you say. Yes, sir. I was born after World War II in the UK. I'm one of the baby boomers, all that goes into that. And I grew up in a professional, well-read family. My parents would do the Times crossword in the first few minutes before breakfast. Very interesting and very good atmosphere to grow up in. And we were always open to talk about whatever was going on, including Christianity and so on, in a very intelligent way. And then I, as I went through the 1960s with all my friends and colleagues, we entered into that state of rebellion that we all went through in that period. And I ended up in the late 60s living in London, ostensibly at university studying, but really playing rock guitar at night, hair well down past my shoulders. And I got to a place in 1969 when I took a decision. I was going to live as if there was no God. And having made that decision, I tried to live it through consistently and without entering into details, God came after me. And I had a very personal meeting with God in August 1969, which completely transformed my life. And it wasn't just that I went back to church. It isn't just that I began to believe my life was turned upside down by God by the Lord Jesus Christ. And later on that year, I met a, a London secretary, red-haired London secretary. If you watch the last performance of the Beatles playing on the roof uh, in London, you'll see in the street as you watch that video, secretaries looking up at the roof to see what was going on. Well, that's where Sylvia was. And she also had had an encounter with God that year. We met, and the next year we were married. And since then, here we are, 54 odd years later on, seeking to serve God. The only major problem I had in my, in my pilgrimage serving God was when God asked me to go into the church. Hmm. I found that a difficult step, not because I didn't like the church or didn't believe in the church, but I didn't want to get taken out of the fast lane. Hmm. And I hope I was consecrated bishop 30 odd years ago, made an archbishop 22 or three years ago. So I hope I've managed more or less to be able to cope with that. And here I am now living in Paraguay, where all three of our children chose to live. And so this is where we came for our, uh, for this time of our life. So there we are, Christian. That's more or less how I got to where I am now. That is fantastic because I, I, I want to start painting this picture around the conversation we're going to have. And it's going to bring elements of music, it's going to bring elements of faith, it's going to bring elements of navigating institutions. And uh, this is the perfect starter to get a sense of where you come. Um, but I want to double tap on the idea of that encounter with the logos, the, the, the meeting with the mind. 
Um, can you elaborate a bit on that, or is it too personal? My meeting with God, you mean? Yes. Yes. Well, I think I grew up believing in God because my mother gave me to God when she conceived me. How that happened, I wouldn't know, and I'd never asked her. But she committed me to God when I was conceived, and I grew up with a sense that it was far more logical to believe in an imminent and transcendent deity who is a person, not just a force or an energy or a meaning or a death or anything like that. So I never really had any major problem believing in God and identifying him with the Lord Jesus Christ and the revelation of Scripture, because the Bible isn't so much a testimony of people's experiences of God. It's more about God speaking to us directly through people and through his word. So when I got to that stage of my life where I realized I was almost, if not completely, well on the way to being postmodern, and then on the way to post postmodern, which was, of course, what my generation has all been about. I made a decision mm -hmm. to live without that, to see what life would be like if I wasn't believing in God. Mm -hmm. I never felt mm -hmm. comfortable with my immorality or the things I was doing. I have to say that. Not mm -hmm. that I didn't enjoy mm -hmm. sin. That would be a lie. But I never felt fully comfortable with it. But when I got to the place of an encounter with God, it was God who came to me. There's a song by Graham Kendrick when he talks about Peter meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, when he came to me, before I go to God, he came to me. And in the August of 1969, I was practicing with the band to do whatever we were going to do at our next gig. And friends from school who happened to be Christians came to say hi. And they sat down and waited till we finished our practicing. And then my friends went off and I had to stay because we were in my house. I had to stay with these school friends and they talked to me about God. And we got to four in the morning and I said, listen, you and I know you can't prove God to me. And they got up to leave. And as they left, the last one turned around and looked at me and said, okay, but what are you going to do with Jesus? Hey, I hey. went up to my bedroom, my bedroom window, looked over the English channel. And it was half four in the morning and it was August in summer. So the sun was just coming over the water over the sea. And I said a prayer. I said, God, if you're there, I want to know you, please. And I slept for a couple of hours, got up at half past six, and then began to walk to the railway station. We were living on the coast to get the train. And as I walked down the steps, no one was there early morning. As I walked down the steps to get to the platform of the railway station, I heard what I thought was some leaves blowing around. And I looked down, it wasn't a leaf, it was a bit of paper. And I noticed the bit of paper and it blew along. And I got to the platform, sat on the bench and waited for the tray. And the paper landed at my feet. I looked down and it said these words. The words of Pontius Pilate. When he said, what then shall I do with Jesus called the Christ? And underneath it said, why haven't you answered this question? And at that oh, moment, oh. sitting on a bench on a railway station in Southeast England, I answered the question. And that's what happened. Wow. That was my encounter with God. I went off where I was going at 11 o'clock. I was having a coffee with a friend. And after a few minutes, he looked at me and said, Greg, what's happened? You're different. I didn't know how to explain it there. But 
I can explain it now. It's, 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 Marvel. it's marvelous. I mean, it's a marvelous story and there's layers there to unpack, but there's ha- beginning with the sincerity of the request in the prayer, right? The, the, the real exhausting of say the intellectual route of parsing the world, uh, and the discontent with the lack of meaning that that may leave you with. And then the sincerity of, of silencing the ego to let the, to let the message come through. Um, and then to have the, you know, incontrovertible evidence of something like that. And I, you know, it's so interesting to say evidence in this context, because it is, it is evidence in the sense that you were looking for that, that specific answer to that specific question. And I think it's easy for people to might to get lost in the specifics of the evidence where, um, everybody has their own requests and their own, uh, um, prayer, silent prayer, the silent hope about the nature of the world, um, and often struggle with silencing the ego and letting the message come through. There's something mighty powerful about when the, uh, the, the things align in such in perfect imperfection and alignment that it, it generates a change in you. And I can't, and, and I think about this personal. The, the amount of lives and where the journey took you and how, you know, generations after, uh, I get impacted by that note that landed on your, on your, uh, on your lap. Um, I think that the causal chain of events is just a beautiful thing to think about. Um, especially in the context of a world that I think, as you were saying, was built by a postmodern generation, a nihilistic generation, um, that seems to be devoid of meaning, right? It seems to be inherently devoid of meaning. Um, and that brings me to my next question, which is, um, what, how do you think about the role of Christianity in the world today? Well, the truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. Christianity is reality. And to live ignoring that reality brings chaos. And we see it around us at the present moment, leaving on one side our concepts of what sin might be and immorality and whatever we, we consider to be um, symptomatic of that. If you live in unreality, it will affect you. We are the creation of God. And what happened to me on that railway station was God doing something. Before I reacted, before I thought, before I decided, God was doing something. And I think that is how we have to see because it's the reality of the thing. Christianity, not just what I believe, not just my understanding of things, not just my personal experience, but reality. The biblical word in Greek, the truth, means just that, reality. If you read the story the Bible tells us, which of course is history, and that works out very well because history is his story. It's what God is doing and what God has done. All encounters with God that you find through the pages of Scripture are first of all God coming to somebody. All right. Um, Well, sorry that the communication cut off. I mean, we still haven't figured out proper the perfect way to communicate across continents just yet, but we'll get there. Um, you, you were saying, you were saying about Christianity being reality and, and how living in a state of unreality leads to chaos. Um, I think intuitively, of course, that is an easy statement to grapple with that, you know, being living aligned with reality is the path to fruition uh, and living in accordance with fantasy is, is, is problematic. Um, there's another layer there that given the context that I come from, the very secular world, the very um, uh, sort of secular materialist worldview, um, that pushes back against a statement like Christianity is truth 
out of instinct because because of the lack of context of at that point the word christianity means something different to you than what it means to the people that might be listening to this right um think objections of the sort of how do we reconcile christianity as a tradition with other traditions who were also seeking seeking truth uh, the the um judaism for instance uh you know farther away things like confucianism uh buddhism hinduism uh and and how do we ascertain the 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 nature of these things fitting together and arriving at the conclusion that christianity is the truth i think first of all we have to realize that if reality is reality there's a difference between our perception and our idea of coming from us out and what god has told us most religions in the world are human attempts to understand things and to interpret things from their own perception and their own experience and there's nothing wrong with that we do it all the time from our earliest days we are looking at the world from the center of the universe which is me and you trying to make sense of it and we make sense of it in different ways and it's quite rational and reasonable to come to the conclusion that there is some sort of meaning that there is a unified answer that there is a god if you like but that doesn't tell us about it mm -hmm. it's almost rationally possible to come to the concept of a deity but who is he or is he a he and i think a major problem for us now in the 21st century is that when the world tried to come to terms with our growing understanding of science we tried to reconcile at that time and i'm talking about late 19th century early 20th century we tried to reconcile the christian story brought out in scripture with what science was telling us now really obviously there's no problem I guess if there was a problem it was the idea that we were now understanding everything fully which is what of course every generation mm -hmm. believes we now understand and when conflict came because modernism didn't enable us to fit god into a mm -hmm. world view we either had to reject god completely and come into a place of pessimism and try and find some sort of hope within the pessimism or we had to go to believing the bible and what we did was to produce a synthesis we took christianity from our idea of the real world and we put it into a kind of my real world my subjective real world so that now when i talk about my faith people say oh that's fine that's what you believe and they have no idea that what i'm talking about is something that is as real for them as it is for me only they're ignoring it they simply believe that is my perception rather than that is god having revealed himself i was on an airplane once flying into buenos aires and when people see these things sometimes well they all act in different ways i remember one gentleman uh, saw it and he realized he had to sit next to me on the plane for 8 hours and he started off saying well i suppose you'll want to know what i think of god and i was able very quickly to say well how about me telling you what god thinks of you this particular lady after trying to make a confession to me she was a roman catholic and i was trying desperately to explain the difference between an anglican archbishop and a roman catholic archbishop before she told me too much about her sins then she came out with that statement oh well it doesn't really matter does it what you believe as long as you believe it that's postmodern faith 
doesn't mm-hmm. matter what you believe as long as you believe it. And I smiled at her because it's always nice to be friendly towards people when you're going to destroy their basic underlying thought patterns. And I said, tell me, madam, when you send somebody to do your shopping and they say, what shall I buy? Do you by any chance say it doesn't matter what you buy as long as you buy something? Or when you're planning a trip and the agent says, where do you want to go? Do you say it doesn't matter where I go as long as I go somewhere? Or when you're sick and you go to the pharmacy or the chemist and they ask you what medicines you want, you say, well, it doesn't matter. Just give me anything. She said, no. I said, well, don't you think it's rather dangerous to risk your eternal destiny to something as unrealistic as what you've just said? It matters very much what I believe. I can say it's intolerant to be a Christian, but the universe is intolerant. Having to breathe oxygen is intolerant. Having to drink pure water is intolerant, but try breathing something else or drinking impure water and you'll soon appreciate intolerance is not always a bad thing. Christianity is an exclusive reality. Now, Obviously, we I... respect and we treat everybody with the same respect. And we don't think people are stupid because they don't believe. Of course not. But we believe in Christianity as real truth. Otherwise, we are living in a false idea of Christianity. Which, of course, the Jews who rejected Jesus, not because they were Jews, but because they chose not to accept Jesus as the Messiah, denied it. Just as people today deny it. Why? Because it didn't fit in with what they wanted it to be. It was sincere. But it's possible to be sincerely wrong. Truth is truth. Reality is reality. And we treat everything with enormous respect and with the humility that it mm-hmm. demands. But either it's true or it isn't. The, there's, there's something that, there's two layers that I want to explore. Um, there's, I, I think that there, the gen, our generation, and especially the one that comes after mine, needs a reminder of the objective nature of reality. That, that there is a structure that is that is what it is, and you can conform to it or you cannot. And uh, examples that you've brought of oxygen and basic biological needs are sort of, uh, you know, like we can think of them as unjust burdens on sentient creatures. But I think you're right. It's just what it is, right? And so we have the project of life is figuring out how to deal with these constraints. Um, there's another aspect that I think he, he, I want to maybe paint a rounder picture of what you said so that people don't don't get immediately react to it, that Christianity is exclusive in its beliefs. Um, because I, I, while I agree that there is a very strict standard of what falls within the canon and what doesn't, the, the, the um, core belief itself is very inclusionary. Everybody's welcome. Every, come as you are, and you know, God will meet you where you're at. So there's those two forces that are at tension with each other. And, and I think the modern zeitgeist flavor of Christianity, the one that we hear about uh, through two hops in a network, where, you know, people talking about talking about Christianity has the connotation of it being intolerant. Um, but I think that that is a, is a semantic battle that was uh, lost by Christianity uh, in the sense that it, was, it allowed itself to be defined that way when originally the message of Jesus was doesn't your racial background doesn't matter. Your, uh, the, the statute of your fam- bloodline doesn't matter. You know, like who you are is the sentient creature that decides how to navigate in the world. Um, and so I think I want to take this chance just to reclaim that a little bit because I think it gets lost. And, and, and even though there's, a, <clears throat> there's merit to the fact that we need to align ourselves with objective reality and that we can't forfeit the idea of objective reality. Um, I think we, it's a good time to remind everybody that this is, this is a belief system that uh, has way more breadth 
and flexibility and, and range than the narrow prescriptions that we get, the narrow drops of misinformation that gets spread about it. Uh, I think it's how we, Jesus talked about Christianity as being narrow. It is narrow in the sense that it is truth and it's reality. He says it's, it's narrow. And it's exclusive in the, the sense narrow path. That yeah, it is truth. But God's love and God's attitude to us is love for everybody, and it's an inclusive love. That does not mean that we can live any way we like, and that's all right. But it does mean that God comes to me where I am and talks to me where I am and seeks to help me to understand things where I am in my cultural views, in my language, in my way of seeing things. And God, who knows me better than I know myself, treats me with perfect love and perfect justice. Now, there is, there are two stories going around, neither of which is the truth. One is that God is love and therefore everything's all right, really. It is all right, really, but that doesn't mean I can do what I like. The other error is to say only people that agree with my understanding have any hope. That is equally wrong. Universalism is false because it doesn't mean I can just do what I like. But narrow, what could we call it, fundamentalism, whatever the correct, politically correct word is today, is not right either. Jesus came to the religious people who believed in God and they rejected him because he didn't fit into their pattern. Now, there are two things I have to always take into account. One is that God has spoken in his word and that the Bible is the word of God. Every time we read in church, we say, this is the word of the Lord. This is God's word. It's true. But my perception of it, my understanding of it, needs to be thoughtful, worked out, and fitting into the whole picture. The trouble is we tend to treat the Bible like we treat a lot of things in the world today, with a kind of pick and mix mentality. We take what we like and we leave on one side what we don't like. You can't do that. So first of all, we have to take scripture in the light of scripture. Now, I know when I get to glory, when I get into the presence of God, very likely I would say, oh, didn't get that. Well, but I know there won't be a contradiction between what I've read in the Bible and what I see there. There might be a contradiction between my understanding. Might even be a contradiction between reality and the way I've experienced. But there will be no contradiction between what the Bible has told me. And the other thing that will never change is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is always the Son of God. God. And he said, I am the way, not this is the way. I am the truth, not this is the truth. I am the life, not this is the life. God's name, when he presents himself to Moses, is I am. So, what do I do? I have, as you can imagine, taken any number of funerals in my
40 years as a priest in the church. I have taken an incredible number of funerals, most of them for people I'd never met. And never did I commit somebody to God without knowing fully that God was just. That I had no trouble saying to God, here is this person who we love. Now, that doesn't mean automatic salvation for everybody. The Bible doesn't say that. But God is just, not me. So God deals with that. So I take into account everything I have in the Bible. If you ask me, I'll tell you. But at the end of the day, I believe in him. And it might very well be when I get that I will say, oh, didn't get that. Oh, dear. But there'll be no contradiction. And I know I am loved. And I know what it means to say I am loved. My mother was an English lady. I've already said she committed me to God when I was conceived. She was English. I once rushed into the kitchen as a small child and threw my arms around her and she said, what are you doing? She was English. <laughs> English people today are probably different. I'm not talking about prison English people. So you don't have to disagree with me, those who are watching this. But one day, driving my mother somewhere, in the car, she said, Gregory, you are loved. And I knew that that was true. She never hugged me. She never kissed me. She never called me her little prince or anything like that. But I knew I was loved. And God loves us. And knowing you are loved is what makes the difference. But God is also good and holy. And there are things you don't do. I've been married to my dear wife, Sylvia, for 53, 54 years. And I have always sought to be faithful to. And how would you feel if I said, having been married to Sylvia for 53, 54 years, I've been 90% faithful to? I think most people would disagree with that. Why? Because it doesn't work like that. It's the same with God. It's the same with God. But there's I am not in any way going to be surprised when I get into the presence of God and I realize that my understanding was much more limited than I ever thought it was. God will still be God, and he will be the God that I've sought to know and who knows me. Um, I, I want to put a pin on the uh, you are loved comment, because I want to I want to eventually get to Paraguay and San Andres and how that was one of the core tenets of my education, a feeling of being loved. So I want to I want to make sure we get to it in a bit. There's there's another underlying thread there that is. Um, in the project of figuring out the uh, mind of God, the personality of God, we draw from scripture, we draw from commentary on scripture, we draw from, uh, from the, uh, you know, spaces that are created to explore and, and to let the spirit come and sort of like speak through different people. Um, and there's, there's a tradition built around that. There's institutions built around that. And, and some of the greatest uh, conflicts have come from disagreements in those in those rooms, right? The 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 Martin Luther's theses that create the big, you know, uh, the uh, separation from the Catholic Church, the rejection of the Pope, uh, the subsequent alignment that happened throughout all of Protestantism, uh, and and so there's these layers upon layers of um, <clears throat> institutions that affect, say, the, every person's connection to God, right? Not, not everybody was there in Nazareth when Jesus was born. And there's a chain of, of, of uh, 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 you know, of imperfect messaging from source to uh, recipient. Yeah. And 
even things like, you know, the, the, the Pharisees rejecting Jesus, you know, there's, there was a process there, a, a human system established to, you know, reason around these ideas. And we know that those institutions are imperfect because the failings in humanity that we're all too familiar with in our own selves, right? Um, how do we make sense of the fact that we have many versions of these institutions uh, or flavors of the of, of these beliefs claiming to be truth, having gone through this process. And, you know, you can say, you can make an argument both ways in the sense that you, the closer you are to the source, uh, the more pure the message is. That's one way to think about it. But then there's the other way that is, no, 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 you need to go through iterations of refinement to really distill the, the core message, right? Um, how do you think about that in, the, in a world in which like, we're all part of structures within structures and we are, we're reasoning with models of reality? Um, how, how is your take about how an agent in a structure thinks about that? Well, I said earlier that perhaps for me, the biggest problem I faced was choosing whether or not I would go into the ordained ministry in the church. Um, yep. What started as one united church that Jesus called my church, his church, is now divided into whatever, 35,000 denominations. It's a scandal. It's the result of history. And whatever we do to seek to get together to dialogue, it's a very big question. Perhaps the, the biggest question is, okay, so I believe, where do I go if I want to meet with others? And the only way I deal with that is to say, I believe that some churches depend more on the Bible than other churches. Now, you remember when you were at school at St. Andrews in Asuncion, Although it's an Anglican school, you were taught the Bible, not Anglicanism. And I think that is how the church should be. Welcome to a bit of the church. But my job is to teach what God has told us, not the way we have turned it in our particular institutionalized form. Now, this is not easy. It's a real, really difficult problem. But we have to belong to something that we recognize as a part of the church. We have to realize what its errors are. And we have to be a part of it. And I really don't know the real answer to that other than when it's down to me, I seek to teach what this says. I seek to clarify. I've spent my life, as you can imagine, Christian, teaching, trying to teach church history. There's a book uh, in Spanish I put together a few years ago about the Anglican way of, of seeing Christianity, but also what's gone wrong in the Anglican side. If God had put me where he's put me in the bit he put me in, I don't know what I would have done, and I don't know what I would do, to be very honest about your question. Yes. But I know when I'm talking to another Christian, and I know whether I'm talking to somebody who's religious and very loyal to his institution, but not somebody who really has believed what Jesus has told us mm. about Christianity. I don't judge, them, but there's a difference between being religious and being somebody who knows God and is known by God. Um, I don't believe there is an institution today that we can say this is the true church. I don't believe there ever was. I believe in the first century, the church was local and what we call Catholic, not Roman Catholic, but Catholic in the sense of one sort of universal body. But the government of the church wasn't vertical. The government was local and mm -hmm. synodical. 
was councils, people mm -hmm. who met together and prayed and sought to hear what God was saying. Now, I have no problems with my friends, for example, in the Roman Catholic Church, the present Pope happens to be a good friend of mine. We were very good friends when he was a cardinal in, uh, in Buenos Aires and I was there as archbishop. He knows what I think. I know what he thinks. But we could always give each other a hug, as you do in Buenos Aires, because we consider ourselves brothers and family. I think there are some denominations that have gone off the rails. And I think there are some that are trying very hard, but have got their basic ideas wrong. But I think we've got to keep everything open, keep in dialogue, keep working it out together. But always remember, this is where we find truth. And this says nobody comes to the Father but through Jesus. This says God is like this. So I can't mm. come to, with my idea of God and change it. I submit my view of God and my view of the church to what the scripture says. But I recognize I can get it wrong and I listen and I try to learn and I try to hear what others are saying. And I try to adjust my thinking in the light of what I learn as I go through it all. But I've no contradiction between what I consider to be the church as revealed in scripture and my relationship with other Christians in the yeah. world. My problem has always been with the institutions, not with yeah. them as authority, but the way the institution manages itself when it tries to do that in a way which doesn't mm -hmm. tie in with the scripture. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think that's all that's, I think it's the, it's become the primary, primary criticism of, of, of Christianity is that the institution, this is a criticism that I think is, is present for every institution these days. Yeah. I think there's, there's been an unveiling of the, the, let's call it the feigned sanctity of and institutions. The whole, sorry, just the whole religious authority ones. thing, the whole question, the whole authority, authority thing. thing. I'm an archbishop. I was a headmaster. In my time as a headmaster, when members of your family, including your dad, were, were at school, my authority was quite different from a headmaster's authority today. When yeah. I walked around the school, there was silence. Not because people were necessarily afraid of me, but because we had a certain view of authority. Now, when I was in Buenos Aires as Archbishop and the Bishop of, of Argentina for 21 odd years, most people called me Che. Che is a sort of equivalent of in English, English, oi, you. And that's fine. Same degree of respect, affection, just different language. But I agree with you mm -hmm. fully, Christian. It is a major problem, and we have to get to grips with it. Because the whole image mm -hmm. of Christianity is confused with people's perception of the institution, whichever mm -hmm. one that happens to be. And, you know, mm -hmm. but it's Jesus' church, and he said, I will build my church, and so I trust that it's not a situation that can't be faced and dealt with. But remember what I said right yeah. at the very beginning. My biggest decision was, do I really want to work in the church within mm -hmm. the ordained ministry? For the very things you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I, I can see it. I mean, especially coming from your uh, rebellious background. You know, I, I, I see the picture of of somebody who is discontent with authority in the first place and 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 I think I can't even begin to imagine the the kinds of uh challenges that you went through in navigating the internals of 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 the career you've made um but I I want to also explore this this theme with you that is um on scripture uh, on the concept of scripture where um 
there are statements in scripture, like I am the way, the truth, and the light, that to, the, uh, to people without the right context may appear disconnected from their model of the world, right? So it, 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 it would be as if hearing somebody somewhere really long ago said that they were God and we just take that at face value. Why should you take that at face value? That would be the, the inherent criticism of it. Um, it's not until you get a bit of context and you understand where the con the context of the words and the 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 layers of meaning that are stacked on not just the words but the choice of the words, the placement of the words, the numbers associated with the words. Like there's so many layers of harmonies that get you to actually appreciate what the words mean and how they apply to your life. Um, how do you, how do we, and, in, and, and I think this is important to mention because if without the context, the, the statements may be rejected, right? But if they may be rejected offhand because they haven't been appropriately contextualized. Um, I wanted to sort of open up, you know, because we're talking about scripture. And I think this, is, this would be a good chance to touch on some of these concepts going with the, you know, the very beginning of, uh, the, um, of John. And in the beginning was the word and sort of do a little exercise of exploring in the beginning was the word. And what does that mean for somebody? And I can bring some context in the sense that I can link it to things like computer science and code. And there's an analogy that is inevitable there in between the word of God and how it shapes reality and code and how it shapes, you know, whatever it is you build with software engineering. Um, but why don't we start there and sort of start to unpack how these layers are actually built uh, so that people can then approach something that, you know, earlier on in this conversation, they may have disagreed with because like because of cultural conditioning um, and begin to see how these layers may affect their perception of what's real. I think we have to, first of all, understand how we think and why we think the way we do. I remember coming to a kind of, epiphany of thought in my late teenage years before I had an encounter with God, when I realized what postmodernism was all about. And we had to think through, what is my paradigm? We have to ask ourselves, how do I think and why do I think like that? I came to a place where I understood a little bit about my postmodern thinking. And I grew up through that period. I can put months and dates to it. For example, the Beatles conquered the States yeah. with a song which nobody had any trouble understanding. I want to hold your hand. It was clear. So. They were able to win the hearts, not just of the young people, but the acceptance of the parents because, oh, well, all he wants to do is hold hands, so that's all right. The Rolling Stones had bigger problems with their lyrics, but we won't go into that now. I want to hold your hand. Three years later, the same Beatles were singing. I am he as you are he. As we are, we are not, we are all together. I am the egg man. We are the egg men. I am the walrus, goo goo kachoo. That was the shift. We shifted from literal words that we can understand to anything goes. The same thing happened in our morality. Let me take you down to strawberry fields, nothing is real. And that was postmodernism. And in my postmodern thinking, I was totally sold out to relativism. Whatever you think, it's true for you. I had to get to a place where I acknowledged that there was truth that was true whatever I thought about it. And I came to that place through, 
for example, John's gospel. Jesus is the word. In other words, God doesn't just speak ideas. He speaks words. And the words have a meaning. And the words have a propositional meaning. So when Jesus says to the disciples, they say, well, show us God and everything will be fine. He says, I'm here. Haven't you seen me? In other words, God was telling us that he had become a man. And that man lived and taught and did things and then died on a cross a cruel death. He was rejected almost fully by everybody. The crowd shouted, crucify him. And he died saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Comes back to what we were talking about earlier, about how far do I understand all this? So we have to understand how we think and why we think the way we do. And then we have to understand what we learn from what Jesus said about how people think. Now, the Bible says we were created in the image of God. That means God has given us qualities which are in common with him. And one of them is to be able to think and to reason and to understand and to work things out logically. Anglican theology is scriptural, and we take into account reason, how we think, our understanding. That doesn't mean I'm going to understand it all. But I think when we're dealing with the present world, and you will understand it far more than I do, Christian, because you've grown up in it and you're living in it at the moment. We have to understand how the world thinks. We have to take how the world thinks in the light of what the Bible tells us. And we have to learn how to share with words what we have learned from the Bible and help other people to come to a place, always bearing in mind that before I'm talking to anybody, God is already loving them and working in their lives and seeking to help them to understand. But if you remember your school days, and it was the way it was at the beginning when I was doing my job in St. Andrews, we taught this every day. Not what I thought or what the teachers thought, but what this says. And we left all of you and some of your parents and all the rest of it with the job of working it out because that's what God does. It's not easy. And living in a sort of liquid deconstruction, whatever we call it these days, it's not easy. But there's nothing new under the sun, Christian. And if you go to the time of Jesus, Greek philosophy, Roman pluralism, everything that was going on in the first century. You remember when Paul preached in Athens? And he talked about the unknown God. You've got gods, as many as you want, but you've got one dedicated to the unknown God. Well, I'm going to tell you about him. And I think, you know, that is somehow maybe relative to this, to this also. Not an easy question, though, Christiana, not one you can do, but you have to work it through. There is an author that was helping a lot of us when I was a young, when I was a student, called Francis Schaeffer. And it's good to read Francis Schaeffer and his way of helping us to understand how we got into at least postmodernism. Then you'd need to go into post-postmodernism yes. and all the things that came after that. But uh, Francis Schaeffer Okay. Fantastic. I, I, the reason I asked this question is because I 
have been very interested in the, the chain of events from source to recipient, uh, from, and, and I'm the, and all the way, all the way down to the very beginning. And, and there's layers there and harmonies there that have been extraordinarily surprising to me. Um, things for instance, like the fact that the gospels are written in Greek, which is not the original language of Jesus, but the, the, it's the English of the time. It is the most widely spread language and, uh, it comes with all kinds of cultural mannerisms and all kinds of, um, definitions, uh, of words that have carried, you know, layers upon layers of meaning. And the one I'm referencing specifically is when in the English translation of in the beginning, there was the word, the word, the word was actually in Greek logos and and just exploring that yields so many dividends for me in the sense that, oh, where does the word logos come from? What has the word logos impacted? And logic comes from logos and reasoning. Uh, uh, logos as in symbols, brands, comes from the same idea. So then, so then you start to paint a more comprehensive picture of what this statement is really trying to say is that there, there's, upon the layers of exploration, there's okay, there's a symbol, but the symbol has a rational structure to it. And what, you know, you know, you can take that all the way to the calendar and you can take that all the way to all of the cultural, um, call them affordances that have been inherited by Christianity from traditions of the past and traditions of the past and traditions of the past going on to time before memory. Um, and so I think that there's, there's, a unique opportunity these days to explore um, the, these uh, offhand, I don't want to say offhand statements, but the greatest hits of Christianity and really peel back the layers a little bit and see that there is a connection there that resonates with the rational soul uh, that seeks to make sense of this world, right? Um, and, and there's another really <clears throat> interesting version of the same idea that, you know, logic gives birth to computer science and computer science gives birth to code. And all of a sudden that starts to paint a different picture of what this statement is trying to make. This is like, in the beginning, there was the code. There was the code and the code gives rise to everything. And the code is the same thing as, as the creator. And, and that is a fun set of stories to play around in your head as it informs your model, right? G.K. Chesterton in one of the Father Brown stories, I think it's in the first Father Brown story he wrote, which is called The Blue Cross, came out about 1910, says through the priest, through Father Brown, God himself is bound by reason. Now, you have to unpack that a little bit. Mm -hmm. But as I've said on a number of occasions during this conversation, whatever I find out about what I haven't understood when I get to glory, there will be no contradiction with what I have found in the word. Mm -hmm. It will help me maybe to understand something I hadn't understood. And the fact that the word is a person, Hebrews chapter one says, God has spoken to us through, obviously through the Old Testament, through the prophets, through the Lord, but now he's spoken through his son. And the fact that God's word is his son. He is the word. Therefore, in Jesus, we don't just hear, we can see and experience the word. And words are far more than just sounds and things with meaning. When Jesus says, you know, what he says, he is talking to us as the word. It was very good that you brought up uh, John chapter one, because that really makes a big difference in the way. One thing that people need to do if they want to understand the word of God is go to Bible Gateway. Find uh, the book of the Bible you're looking at. And if it's New Testament, go to the Greek translation. And that will then tell you not just the word in Greek and the word in English or whatever. It will tell you what the Greek means, why the Greek means that, and all the things 
that Christian is here talking about layers. This whole thing about the Greek language, which has all this uh, behind it, which is obviously why God chose to have the epistles and the gospels and so on written in the Greek language. That was God's decision. That was an accident that just happened. And it's interesting that the, the Greek you find in, uh, in the New Testament is there are different Koine Greek, which is street Greek and all the rest of it. It's, it's a fascinating thing to do. But Bible Gateway is a great way of getting to grips with the text Greek. and getting to grips not just with the meaning of the Greek, but where those words appear in different places in the Bible and how you can understand all the various uh, layers of the meaning there. It's it beyond interesting. And I think it, 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 it helps clarify, it helps denoise the, the source message from the, the regurgitation of the regurgitation of the regurgitation. But it somehow there, it, it does this really beautiful thing where you can see, you know, the version that you consume and compare it to more, you know, different flavors, different dimensions of the same idea. And so, and then the, in the intersection is where the really beautiful things start to appear, or at least that's where I've gotten a lot of fruit, uh, sort of in, in my journey of being raised Christian, living in a very Christian country, going to a very secular context, uh, with a lot of technological prowess and might and, uh, and, you know, uh, empowerment, and then sort of trying to put it all together into this picture of how do I make this this picture of the world fit in my in my mind there's another there's another element there that is um coupled with the the elements of of um scripture that is faith and the idea of faith as a as a subscription and and as a commitment that we must make and there's and i wanted to sort of let you freestyle on the concept a little bit as you've you know, experience faith in your life and how faith has taken you places that you probably never would have imagined. Um, what's faith? What go for it? First of all, um, let's make clear to those who are sharing this moment. I did not ask you to tell me beforehand what you were going to talk to me about because I wanted to come to this the way we're coming to it. So I haven't got a bit of paper here with everything that I worked out at three o'clock in the morning. Faith, for me, begins with relationship. I believe the word of God, but I believe it because, first of all, Jesus is the word of God, and I know God through Jesus, and I trust Jesus. And I trust God, and that's faith. I believe his word, and I believe in his personality. And like everybody in this world, I have been through some extremely difficult circumstances, some of them very, very, very painful. But at the end of the day, I trust God. Even when I don't understand. And that is faith. Now, believing in God is more than faith. It's a relationship. But it isn't just that I take a leap in the dark and close my eyes and hope. I get to know him because he has come to me and he has opened my eyes and helped me to see he's done something in me. It's not just me looking out into the darkness. It's the light coming to me in a person. And knowing the person, I know light, and I see things in the light. And faith is trust, and trust leads us. It's a difficult word, but we can say, Obedience it doesn't mean just doing what I'm told. It means living in the light of the love that a person has for me and the love I have for that person. And that causes me to do things in a certain way 
so that I don't go against what that person is and who that person is and what that person means. For example, in marriage, there are lots of things I could have done, but a number of them I didn't do because I don't want to hurt my wife. Doesn't mean I didn't have the right, maybe, to do certain things. But love and obedience go together. Now we don't like the word obedience, I know, because it all comes in as if there's as if I'm not free. But I am free because I'm loved. Every time we do a wedding, the first question to the couple is, Do you want to marry this person? Because love is free. Love is free, and love is about trust and faith, and that's friendship, but it's much more than friendship. Jesus said, you are my friends, I'm your friend, because we're in a relationship. So faith means knowing God, knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in me, and he helps me to know him, and knowing him, I believe him. I trust him, and even when I don't understand, and there are many things I don't understand, there are many things in Christianity which are, in our way of seeing things, antinomies. They, they, are, they seem to be contradictions. They're like parallel lines that don't mean but we trust. We trust because we know mm-hmm. God, or we know God. And the worst thing I can do about someone is to say, you can't trust what they've said. I trust what mm. God has said, even when I don't understand. So faith is relation and it's knowing God and being known by God. When I made that decision sitting on a railway bench in 19, August 1969 in the southeast of England, it wasn't just that I decided to believe in God. It was that I knew God yeah. in a personal way. Same as I know you, Christian, same as you know me. It's a relationship. It means, mm-hmm. and the person is a person. But, wow, there, what a question. What a subject. <laughs> it's fun. I mean, I, I think, well, I think there's a, there's a broader sense of people sort of catching the grift of, of, the modern zeitgeist and, and seeing that there's layers of meaning that we've forfeited and that we, that there's something empirically missing about the picture that we've painted as, you know, in in the distilled mythology of the modern times. And, uh, and I think, I mean, the, the reason I brought up faith was because, you know, you know, you get to that point where you, um, where you are dissatisfied with the worldview and, Oh, and then you, you have to make that sincere change that is unprovable. That is, you're out of the model that you've been in. You have to leave the house. And, and, and there's a very real sense of, I know that I am artificially putting myself in this position and I have to trust that. And I think that that is, that is, that is something, but in that very difficult process, a humbling process, uh, uh, you know, uh, an incredibly life flattening process, uh, is the cure to the nihilism, the cure to the nothing has meaning, the cure to nothing matters anyway, we're all going to die. All of that goes away as soon as you believe, as soon as you allow yourself to believe that there could be something more, right? That they could, that this could be not enough. This is insufficient. And, and faith is a difficult word. I mean, there's a difficult world in word in a world that institutions have abused of the faith that we put in them. Right. And yeah. now, you know, sort of with the flood of information that we have, we can see where those failings were and it becomes even more difficult to have faith. Right. Um, but it is also the only balm that I have found to navigate all of these, you know, radical changes that society is going through. Um, I wanted to uh, dive deeper into the, the, the places that your mission and your calling took you and talk a little bit about Paraguay, because as somebody who's seen what you've seen and to have landed upon perhaps one of the most remote places in the world 
And then to have chosen to stay there and come back after it, even after a while of being gone. All right, most reverend Archbishop Gregory Venables, thank you for doing this again after the technical issues yesterday. I'm actually grateful for the technical issues because I meant to ask to start with a prayer to, to really set the tone for the conversation we were going to have. And I was so excited and nervous that I forgot. So now that we get a chance for the do-over, why don't we begin with that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this enormous privilege of sharing together in your presence. We thank you that you're with us and you are with us personally in your power, in your love, in your goodness. And we just ask not that you'll just accompany us, Lord, but that you'll guide us and work through this conversation to do your will. We thank you so much, Lord, for your care for us, your love for us, and your good purposes. So be with us now, and we commit this time to you in the name of your Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, okay, so yesterday we talked about your story, we talked about the role of Christianity in the world, we talked about faith, we talked a little bit about the Word and the Logos, we talked about faith and where it takes you unexpected places, and I think the last item we did not get to explore was the place that you ended up in, that I was born in, and that serves this incredibly special and unique place in both of our stories. And I wanted to hear what your perspective was on Paraguay. Uh, given that you have such a global perspective and understanding of the world. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess my connection with Paraguay is simply that that turned out to be the place where we came when we first decided to ask God to use us and to send us wherever. And I was very clear when we were living in the southeast of England at that time, that if God had said, stay here where you are, we could have done that. We could have gone to anywhere in the world. I've spent my life traveling. I've had a lot to do with Africa and Asia and the Americas and Europe and Australasia. And I, I really liked all the places I've been in. But as it turned out, here we are in Paraguay, which began simply because when we were in dialogue with the church back in the 70s, they said, well, we'd like you to go to Paraguay. Now, what I didn't know at the time was that this school had started in Asuncion and they were looking for somebody who might go there as a head teacher, a headmaster. I didn't know that. And so I turned up here with Sylvia in January 1978. We left London, snow, ice, and we turned up here in 42 degrees with high humidity. Although in those days of the political situation, the temperature was never allowed to go over 39 degrees by orders, superior orders, fair enough. <laughs> But it was wow. actually over 40 in that time. And within a short time, they'd asked me to be the headmaster, the principal, the head teacher of the college. And so we were here for 12 years. Then we went elsewhere. We spent time in Bolivia, Argentina, but by different situations, all three of our children live here in Paraguay. So when the time came for us to say, okay, I've got to a certain age, you don't retire, you refire and you just go around doing the same things, maybe in different ways. And it just seemed right to come here to Paraguay. But we came here more than, let's say, over 30 years since we left. 
And anybody who knows anything about anywhere in the world is that 30 years is a long time in the history of a culture and a country. And we came back to Paraguay, but of course it wasn't the Paraguay we left 30 years ago. Mm. And we weren't the same people who left here 30 years ago. But here we are, and this is where we are now. And if you ask my wife, she would say, well, it's where we are, and that's where we are. <laughs> it's not a case of do we like it more or less. <clears throat> You just have to be where you are, and we're very happy to be in Paraguay. And as you said, Christian, it's a very different place. The only way you can know Paraguay is to be in Paraguay. Mm -hmm. And nobody goes to Paraguay unless they're going to Paraguay. You don't go to Paraguay to go somewhere. You go to Paraguay because you're going to Paraguay. And here it is. Here it is. It is where we are, and we consider it an enormous privilege. It's not easy to retire, although you don't mm. retire. It's not easy. I had, let's say, full authority over the Anglican Church in South America for many years. It's not easy to suddenly let go of that kind of authority, but you do it, and you keep going. So here we are. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's a very unique place. It's the kind of place that the more distance I feel from it, the more special it becomes. I think of, I think of Tolkien's description of the Shire as being very, very fitting for Paraguay, uh, where you know, the very pleasant, very uh, uh, fertile land, a uh, very friendly people. Uh, not the tallest, perhaps a little hairy people um, who like to till the land and drink ale and let the superpowers concern themselves with the fate of the world. Paraguay will remain Paraguay in an <clears throat> indomitable and endearing way um, with all its flaws and, and, and virtues. Um, but I wanted to, to ask you specifically because there's, there's the second layer of the choice. Right. And, and, the, and the seeing the choice happen with your with your kids, too, who I got to meet when I was in when I was in school. Um, and so and maybe let's unpack St. Andrews a bit more and, and the philosophy there. And uh, because I think that also is, is a very interest, perhaps the most interesting aspect of my upbringing is being in a uh, Protestant school with one philosophy embedded in a Catholic society with a very different philosophy. And so there, there was embedded critical thinking about the way society functions because of, of uh, St. Andrews, but also in the philosophy of, you know, the tagline of the school, ex amoris sapientia, um, which just, it's the thing that I felt the most throughout my childhood. And it's the thing that I am most grateful for. And I think very unique. Why don't we talk a little bit about St. Andrews and the philosophy there? Well, very much, I didn't know this. I mean, I, I turned up here in January 1978 knowing nothing. I knew a little bit about Paraguay. I knew about Dr. Francia. I knew about the Mariscal, the Triple Alliance, a few things like that, the Chaco War, but not, not a great deal. I knew the first iron foundries were here, the railway trains, of course, being a Brit, I can talk for hours about the weather or the railway system. But um, I soon realized that I identified with the vision of the school because it's embedded in the love of God and the love that we receive from God and share one with another. Now, I don't know that that was a considered purpose when it was set up. Dorothea Wedgwood, she was a member of the Wedgwood family from, from Britain. She was here as a missionary. She had to leave her work in the Chaco. And she was one of the, what the newspapers called the heroines of the Chaco. But she had to come here and the bishop hadn't got the first idea what to do with this lady. And she said, well, can I just maybe start up a little preschool or something 
in the chapel on uh, on Espana, and she did, and it was God's will, and God did it. But what evolved under God's direction was, in a secondary way, the word you used earlier on, Protestant, a secondary way, Anglican. It was about God, it was about the Bible, it was about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was about living in the reality of who God is and God's love and God's purposes. And I think because it was of God, it just went forward. I think there are certain things in life which God does because God wants to do them. And I consider St. Andrews one of those things. The image I always had of it was we were in this rather dark world, not Paraguay, the world. Mm -hmm. But there are places where a little ray of light from heaven shine down. And I've always been convinced that a little ray of God's light shines down on the corner of España and Santos, where the school is, uh, is set. And I think that's God. And it always has been God. And it seems to go on being God. When I left the school, I was right there in the very heart of everything. It was my life. It was my vision. But I knew it was time to leave. And I just let go as I do when I leave wherever I leave. But God was here continuing. If it had failed when I left, then it would have been wrong what I'd done. If what you do doesn't go on getting better when you leave, you've done something wrong. And mm -hmm. it's continued. It's not perfect. And that's why it's real. It's mm. not It's not in any way, I think, anything that you can understand if you haven't been a part of it, what you were saying mm -hmm. earlier on. And I think, I don't know where it's going to go now. I am mm. here. I feel there's a lot of things that could happen. They asked me to oversee the, the school board while I'm here, which mm -hmm. I do with a great sense of privilege. But all I do is just leave the meeting. Other people mm -hmm. do it. That's always been my secret. I get a brilliant team around me, mm -hmm. and then I can just sit and drink tea and let everybody else get on with doing all the work. And it continues. I mean, nobody knows where Paraguay is going to go any more than we know where anywhere is going no, to go. Yeah. But I think... Paraguay can't stop being Paraguay. I like your comparison with uh, Tolkien's Shire because that's a very good image. It's very much... I used to consider it Narnia. For me, hmm. it was Narnia. My dad used to say to me, what's it like coming backwards and forwards? I used to say, it's like going into another room if you like going through the wardrobe. So when yeah. I used to come yeah. from England to Paraguay, it's like I got in the wardrobe and I came out. And then when I went back to England, I got in the wardrobe and came out. That was how I saw it, which I think has got a lot in common with Tolkien's uh, concept of, of Middle Earth as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, there's a... Um... There's something extra special about the um, the Narnia analogy that you have that of the whiplash of transferring from one reality to another. Um, I certainly feel that whenever I fly from San Francisco to Paraguay, um, and it is just it is it's a it's an interesting exercise that gets different over time, and I get more nostalgia every time, but also more gratefulness. Um, and it's, it's very interesting to see a place where that even in the face of such big societal changes, as we've seen in the past 20 odd years, uh, re manages to retain, uh, identity to a remarkable degree. And I feel that not everywhere has been able to retain their identity uh, to the same degree. It's encapsulated in a sense. It's very Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. It's, and as I said, you only come here to come here. Mm -hmm. You don't come here to go somewhere else. 
maybe Ruritania in the Prisoner of Zender might be another mm -hmm. place that has a kind of uh, similarity to it. Mm -hmm. But it is very much that, as you say, yeah. But to know it, you have to come and go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if you know it and you haven't been elsewhere to come back, I don't know that you would catch on to the what it maybe you have to make that sort of but the people here you see I mean when I think of your dad for example he's part of my life in a way that I can't describe people in other parts of the world even though they're part of my life mm -hmm. but I think there is a quality in our relationship with Paraguay which has to do with people. Mm -hmm. It's very relational. My son, our eldest son, has married a Paraguayan girl. So I am related to half of Paraguay. Yeah. Yep. Because that's Paraguay. You know, we're all related. It's not your cousin. It's your mother or father's cousin's daughter. You know what I mean? We're mm -hmm. all somehow or other and you can easily mm -hmm. say when you greet someone here, pariente, and nobody can argue mm -hmm. with it, you know, what mm -hmm. you're talking about. We're all, we're all related, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I think about this a, a good amount, like one of the, um, just how societies are built uh, differently and how certainly Paraguay, but I think in general, a lot of Latin societies sustain relationships for a very long period of time, even intergenerationally. So in Asuncion, you have three generations of, of people living within the same, I don't know, uh, 10 miles or so. Um, and nobody ever leaves. And, you know, it's exponential growth. So you, you know all everybody's cousins. And you, you go to the same school for 12 years, for, from age three to age, and you, even when you go to college, you don't leave. You just enter a new phase of life, but then you still see your family every week. And you still, so the longevity of those relationships and the depth, the compounding effects of that depth, um, I have felt a little sad that that is not more common in other places in the world where uh, the, 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 just the 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 real core life things that you can only understand someone because you see their entire family and you've seen them evolve in their own character uh they went through this phase but then they recovered and then they all and then they did this and then they died and would you imagine they, that is a very beautiful thing um at the same time i also resent sometimes a little bit the lack of individual uh enthusiasm that has made uh, some Western societies develop and formalize to to the degree that they have, right? And so I, I find myself in the balance of 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 uh, you know the 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 good parts and the parts that can be improved, and then really struggling with the relationship there. Um, but overall, I think it is a a very unique place, and it is about the people, and there's something there that, as you said, you just have to experience it. Yeah. You can't, so you can, I can't compare it with anywhere else that I know. There, you know, there are African countries which have things in common, mm. but they're more tribal in a sense. I, I think it's mm -hmm. also because of the cultural, racial mix in, in Paraguayan history, it affects mm. it as well. Because ever so many of us here are, can look back. Now, when you're in Argentina, they base themselves on the fact that they're Italian or Spanish or English or whatever, whereas it's not like that here. But at the same time, it is like that here. You also mm -hmm. think of where your family came from. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's... Those pandemic words. I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> oh. I can hear you. Can you see me? Still triggering. Um... Words from the lockdown it's exactly right i mean and i think it's nice to have some distance from it now to be able to process everything that really happened there um you tell me uh, i can yeah i i i i i know where you're at um 
The um, I have one final question, and I think this is just a testament oh, to to oh, um to all the technical troubles we've been having, and you know the the situation of the world, and how we've become so dependent on technology, and uh, how technology mediates so much of human connection now. Um, what do you make of all that's going on in AI and uh, that whole world? I, I'm not anything like as knowledgeable as I would like to be about it, but I can understand a lot of the, the basics. I think it's natural that we should try to go that way. But a human being is created in the image of God. And therefore, however close you can come to duplicating what we are and how we think and everything, you will never produce anything that's anything other than just a technological um, puppet. Now, Hmm. how that works, I don't know. But I, there's a guy... A friend of mine called John Lennox, he's a scientist, a brilliant Christian apologist, Mm L-E-N-N-O-X, John Lennox, look him up. I did a conference with him once, which was a brilliant thing to be able to do. Look him up. He's Mm. very good on that. But basically, human beings aren't just intelligent animals Mm. or products of whatever. We are the creation of God and we are created in his image, whatever that means. And therefore, you cannot do any more than just try and produce something which maybe reflects some aspects of what we are. Yeah, I think that there's, um, there's, it's a fascinating world because we figured out this way to communicate with these technological puppets in a way that yep. we can't dis- we can't distinguish from the way we communicate with each other and that yep. affords uh room for uh confusion but also a high degree of enlightenment in the sense that it sheds light on what we do without realizing we are doing how much exactly uh, we react instead of act yeah, uh, yeah. human uh, beings are relational we were created in god's image of, to know him and relate which is why the world is relational which is why you can't ru- it isn't just that you can't rule it out it's what we are mm-hmm. and you know, and be, I mean, okay, now, I, I, I really do not know. You were talking yesterday about the next generation. I know so little, apart from my grandchildren, what that is all about. And I'd love to know a little bit more. Mm-hmm. But you can't rule out the fact that that whatever their view of everything is and everybody says it was an avalanche change in the way mm. people think and the way people do things. But you're not going to stop being what you are. Hey, mm. the wind's blowing outside the window. That's probably why the electricity went off. Mm. Probably. I've, got, I've got trees all, all outside here and it's all blowing very highly, but it's sunny. Hmm. Um, yes. The electricity cuts off here every day at the moment. That's that's so sad. It had it had gotten better. And, uh, it had gotten it had got better, but uh, but it's only the last couple of weeks. Hmm. I think uh, yeah, they're... just overloading with the temperatures as well. Obviously, mm-hmm. um, the uh, the trials of of the life in Paraguay. Um, but you know, we've had power outages here in San Francisco. To a my surprise. Oh, yeah, no, no. We've had... It happens. It happens. It happens. Um, Listen, Christian, I'm going to have to push off a moment. There's somebody here banging at me. If you need any more or any picking up or any working through, all you need to do is send me a note and I can do two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, whatever you need, whenever you need. Excellent. Especially sir. when the electricity has come back. So <laughs> you fiddle around with it all and then get back for anything you might like to use or put in or adapt or whatever and i'm here at your call okay 
Thank you, sir. I hope you have a great day. I will reach out in the next few days. God bless you. God bless you. Have a great one. Thank you.